want to thank everybody for joining us today. My name is Tyler Mongan, president of Haku Global. Uh, we are a company focused on one thing is future intelligence leadership. Um, and that's kind of a unique take on foresight, but also on developing uh, the future generation of leaders. And today we've invited uh, Luke Vanderlens uh, to join us. Uh, he's one of our advisors. He's also a professor. And he's going to join us today and give us a presentation. I want to give a little background on Luke, and then I'm going to turn it over to him uh, to give a talk on um, his work around foresight and strategy. Dr. Luke Vanderlin is the program director of the professional studies program at the University of Southern Queensland. And this professional studies program is unique in that it is transdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. It's a postgraduate research development program that includes numerous practices based in futures research projects. Luke's primary research and practice interest is in the area of futures research, human futures, systems theory, foresight, and strategic thinking of organizational leaders. He completed a master's of philosophy focused on futures, uh, future studies at the Institute of Futures Research, and his PhD investigated organizational strategy as it relates to foresight and strategic thinking capabilities in leadership. Lucas published internationally and has research that spans the Asia Pacific region, which includes surveying and interviewing over 2,600 executive leaders. He's published widely in the fields of foresight and strategy, including a book that's titled Foresight and Strategy in the Asia Pacific Region, Practices and Theory to Build Enterprises of the Future. And that was published in 2016. So we're happy to have Luke here today. I wanna to turn it over to him. Thanks for joining us, Luke. Thank you very much for those kind words, Tyler. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the welcome. And this is something, uh, an area that I've been working on for the last 12 years. And <clears throat> um, I guess it's something that's intrigued me. And that is, you know, the notion of foresight as an innate human capability. We all do it. And then how does that relate to the way leaders behave uh, in their organizations? And how does that innate ability translate into uh, organizational leadership and, and, and particularly through the mechanism of uh, strategy um, in order to give direction to the organization. So I've termed this presentation Back to Futures Beyond Strategic Foresight. Um, and the purpose of that title is just to suggest that as futures intelligent leaders, where does foresight and strategy intersect um, in the 21st century? in the behavior of leaders. So I'm just gonna present some of my findings in this space and um, propositions to you. And I'll be more than, more than happy to open up uh, to questions as we move along. So if you do have any questions and I'm sort of midway through a slide, please don't hesitate to just um, interrupt me and ask me a question. So, back in the early 2000s, um, I, I kept on bumping my head against the notion of um, the value of foresight and um, the foresight input into organizational strategy um, not, not actually being taken up uh, by organizations generally. This is a perennial issue um, in the sort of foresight backslash futures research space um, that we, we kind of know that being able to anticipate the future is, is critical, but the uptake by leaders individually and organizations generally is very low. And um, I've been sort of wondering why that is and what's the gap and, you know, typically one would need to look at one's own knowledge base and what we've said about that space uh, in order to get an idea. And I found uh, Michelle Godot's, Godet's um, uh, insight quite true, not just at the time, which was in 2000, but 
right up until now, this seems to be a truism across the board. And that is that it, it that that um, foresight is not widely practiced by decision makers. Um, because when things are going well, they can manage without it. Um, and you'll see why in a moment. It's fascinating. And when things are going badly, it's too late to see beyond. And then he says the ends of their noses. But basically he's saying when things are going badly, um, their, their emphasis remains short term. So even when things are going well, it's short term. And when things are going badly, it's short term. So that sort of explains a little bit about why the uptake and understanding of foresight as an input um, isn't really widely practiced. Um, so the context of the problem that I, I've been unpacking for some time now is understanding that foresight or what is intelligent leadership, you know, um, futures intelligent leadership suggests foresight as an important part of it. But foresight is there to influence decisions. Um, this is what's emerged. It doesn't include the actual decision making. That's usually reserved for someone else with um, more authority and power. Um, so we need to understand that foresight as a concept does not include decision making. Uh, but we all know that foresight is innate. We all have it. We do it. We do it in our family lives. You know, we, we plan the next day and the next week and the next month and in some cases the next year or years. Um, we do that naturally. Uh, but what is it that when we enter into an organizational space uh, as leaders, do we suddenly um, not use that anymore? It's really important uh, and uh, the evidence will be presented in a moment, but it's really important to understand that foresight is only one of a number of variables that inform the strategic decision making. It's not linear and it's not uh, only one variable that leaders consider when they have to make leadership decisions. In fact, um, many leaders choose not to do anything, strategically not to do anything. And as a result, um, they might not even be um, using foresight as one of its input variables. So let's get to what foresight is and isn't. Um, foresight, and this is widely agreed um, in the theory and practice of foresight internationally, is that foresight doesn't predict. Its purpose is to expand the scope of possibility into feasible and strategically meaningful possible futures. So rather than just one future, foresight really seeks to develop a scope of possible futures. Um, and, and, and this is where the confusion arises. I think intuitively, we understand that when combined with strategy and decision making, it can, excuse me, it can be very powerful. So I started these 12 years of research focusing on exactly that. And, and at the time, um, the questions didn't make a lot of sense to a lot of people, but I think um, I've certainly enjoyed the research journey um, up until now and I, I think that we're at a point where we can actually put to bed some of the myths associated with the space. So I'm working on the definitions of individual so we're at the individual unit of analysis i.e the individual in an organization the individual as a leader or the individual just more generally and individual foresight is the human ability to creatively envision uh, possible futures. So there's this notion of envisioning um, um, multiple futures, understanding that that's not easy because the environments within which we function are complex and ambiguous. And then to provide input for the taking of provident care, taking care, uh, doing the prudent thing in detecting and avoiding hazards while seeking to achieve. And then this is 
a preferred future. So this preferred future emerges out of the foresight and we sort of signal what can and can't be, what could be a uh, hazard in, in, in achieving that. Whereas strategic thinking is, is separate. It's regarded as a synthesis of systematic analysis. Now, what you can think of here are previous uh, or existing uh, financial data, um, uh, existing market conditions, uh, uh, available resources. These are all analytical inputs to strategic thinking. Well, what do I have? What can I invest? What is that um, that going to um, uh, do for me? And then the creative or the generative thought processes. And ideally, these are balanced out. They, they shouldn't have an emphasis on one or the other. Now, it's in this area of creativity or generative thought processes. Uh, this is where the, the if I do this, then that will happen kind of hypothesis-driven thought processes kick in. And, and this is done in order to determine the direction of an organization. So the, now suddenly we really are working with one future. And in order to achieve that future, we need to hypothesize that the direction of the organization will achieve it. And, and that can only really work, be done well if we balance the analytical and the creative. And you can see now uh, where the notion of intelligent futures, intelligent leadership starts coming together. All right, and ideally, strategic thinking does require um, possible futures as an input. Otherwise, we um, see leaders uh, function on a default future, which has very little scope. So very quickly, I did, I've been doing research uh, over these years. It's focused on executive uh, C-suite board members and senior managers of large enterprises, mostly in the private sector, but also in the public sector in, in Asia Pacific corporations. I've currently got 1,493 data points. Um, and I also have 142 qualitative um, transcripts of semi-structured interviews and observations. So the quantitative data is all um, collected via online survey. It's, um, it, it's, it's based on psychometric testing and the analysis uses structural equation modeling, which I'm not gonna explain. Well, let's talk about what those interview findings um, were so that we can get a sense of what depth of understanding we can get into uh, this space. Well, the executives generally, and this was very broad, while they don't admit it openly, and in fact, they weren't even admitting it in the survey, they did share with me that they have an absolute agony in thinking strategically. If you think of a leader's fiduciary responsibilities, on the one hand, they have to ensure that the governance and operations of the organizations are running well. But on the other hand, they also have the fiduciary responsibility of setting the organization's direction. And it's in this space that they really struggle. And they find it in agony because they don't know how. They don't know how to do strategy, to be honest. And that's why we've got this proliferation of strategy consulting because the easiest thing to do is not admit that you've got agony in strategic thinking, uh, but rather to get a consultant and you can do a report and, and show that you've done it. Um, they do understand the importance of foresight. They really do. In fact, they're crying out for it. But again, they just don't know how to connect it to that strategic decision making. They do understand those fiduciary responsibilities to be strategic, set direction. And they under also understand that the payoffs are, are really big when it gets done right. But they sense that foresight is too removed from the strategic decision making process in needed in delivering what they are perceive as mostly short term results and their accountability to boards. 
Um, so they do rely on system generated big data analytics, zero based budget budgeting, you know, um, uh, you know, the notion of we did uh, 10 million last year and we're going to grow by 5% and then everybody's incentivized to achieve that 5% growth. So it's a growth mindset and but not in a good way. Um, and those are basically based on data driven forecasts to make decisions that are defensible. So they've got the evidence. Okay, well, we've set a 5% uh, growth. Uh, and that's defensible based on the uh, past facts. So how did we do this research? Well, we started with a model. And this model is derived uh, from, from the psychology. Um, and it suggests that there really are three parts to decision making. The first is to consider this, what's possi what possibly could happen. Uh, what are the possibilities? That then kicks over into, okay, what am I going to do um, to achieve one of those possibilities, my most preferred possibility? And then that then kicks over into making decisions. And these three parts are distinct. They are physiologically distinct, um, but they're also distinct in terms of how strategy, um, uh, the strategy value chain works. So, um, this was the model that informs the research, and I'm not going to explain what this is, but essentially this is the advanced modeling uh, that we derived out of the out of the research. And there's a minus 25% um, correlation you can see between the strategy, strategic making on the far right and the conceptual thinking in the strategic thinking domain on the left. So. Um, C-O-N-C, and that, that sparked interest. So the, the, the empirical model that came out of this was we had foresight separate but feeding into strategic thinking, which then fed into strategy, uh, strategic decision-making modes. And so we got these three parts essentially from the model. I put a circle around that negative uh, correlation just to show that that's the part of the, the model that was um, that raised new questions. All right, so very quickly, we did pick up that K2 undergraduate education is positively associated, uh, associated with analytical thinking, but not related to conceptual thinking. So the idea that as you grow older and are socialized at school, um, reduces your creativity, um, has empirical evidence in this model. And secondly, the more we expose uh, leaders to futures thinkings in all organizational cultures, foresight concepts, processes, methods, their conceptual thought around possibilities and generative thinking actually increases. There's a relationship there. So what did we find? Well, first and most importantly, foresight and strategic thinking are separate, but highly related constructs. Uh, and they're aimed at achieving different outcomes, but they're highly related. And that's where a lot of confusion has come in. Uh, people see them as the same. Uh, foresight is innate. Um, uh, strategic thinking is aimed at making strategic decisions. Foresight is aimed at developing uh, a, a greater scope of possibility and, 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 and a range of possible futures. Um, there is a bias from the results by leaders across those 1,400 odd leaders that we have. There is a bias to make str uh, strategic decisions based on analytical thinking. Um, those elements of strategic thinking that are creative, innovative, ambiguous, and yielding greater levels of emergent strategy, and this is where Mintzberg's notion of emergent strategy, those are suppressed by organizational culture and structure. What are the consequences of these findings? Um, well, most executives and senior managers don't use foresight, or at least they don't um, use the capabilities or potentially the key competencies that they could develop in their organizations to inform strategy. So the strategy 
generally is static, it's short term, it's forecast based, it's top down and, it, and that it all is very dominant. Creative theft and negative creativity are real and foresight capabilities in individuals are limited, limited by organizational culture, structure and processes. So there is a model that's emerged from the um, research, which is based on the idea of first developing viable futures. These can't be motherhood statements. They've got to be viable and feasible. Um, even, uh, uh, even if they're marginally viable, they should um, be developed. That then transitions over into strategic thinking, which should be visible. Um, strategic thinking does not have traction unless it, it is part of a broader organizational conversation. Um, and then that in turn uh, moves towards valuable strategy. And valuable being, okay, now that we know what we're doing, taking action, planning and implementing it. Um, so I didn't include in the slides the the logic that informs this uh, value chain, but we've got about 72% of strategies failing in organizations. It's a large failure rate, um, and that you're all familiar with. So that would be why is, the question that would emerge, why is strategy failing and, what, and as a result not being v valuable? And then backtracking, well then the strategic thinking wasn't right and then backtracking and saying well strategic thinking needed a scope of possibility in order to work so more or less there is a value chain that is sort of got foresight which is cognitive it's speculative um, it's it's seeking to open up possibilities once the task to say okay what should we do as an organization strategically it then shifts into um, or is an input into the cognitive functional area of strategic thinking and then that informs the strategic planning process first starting with a decision so that's a formulative function now that is in summary uh, what I've observed over time um, and I'm happy to open up the, did I make the deadline? Yeah. You're perfect. Two minutes to spare, Tyler. <laughs> um, I hope that was of interest. Um, I'm more than happy to get on with the fireside chats and interact around what I presented. Yeah, so let's, I'd like to open up uh, the questions. I think, you know, uh, Luke has presented kind of this interesting um, dichotomy between strategy strategic thinking and foresight and love to hear you know from you uh, how that how you're seeing that play out in your organization or just shooting a question at Luke and seeing if he can um, help you answer that and um, let's let's open it up for questions I did see one comment in the chat yeah um, from Joyce, Joyce. yeah if most uh, if most executives do not use foresight what do we need to show them what What's in it for them? Um, Joyce, my experience, and I've done quite a lot of uh, work with individual organizations. Um, my experience is that we actually don't necessarily need to illustrate what's in it for them. I think the better way is to explain to them how, the, how good strategy works um, and being able to, for them, say, um, the foresight part is not the whole story, but you need to do the foresight part to make the strategy better. It's more that illustration because um, my, my observation is that a lot of con, uh, consultants in the foresight space, in other words, us, want to do the futures methods and then suggest or uh, suggest to the the organization you have to do uh, this but I don't know how <laughs> mm -hmm. 
they're the ones then that have to take those possible futures and say, okay, what resources are available to me? What can I do? What are my capabilities? Uh, a whole bunch of inputs um, together with foresight will then take us to the strategy process. And let's not kid ourselves as the consultant or as the organizational employee. It's very seldom that they are the decision makers themselves. So I, my argument is we need to show them the value through great foresight practice, that front end and, and illustrate to them the value to their strategy. But that's just my practice experience talking. Uh, look, I, if I may ask, go ahead. May I speak? Yeah. Is it okay to talk? Yeah, please, I mean, go I ahead. Think that's what a fireside chat is. Yeah. My experience with US executives is that if you cannot demonstrate what's in it for them and and th that they're just they're not interested but maybe that's just us yeah. <laughs> maybe that's not uh around the world uh i don't know uh, but that has been my experience now is there something in it for them in terms of foresight sure it's reducing risk, it's making better decisions, it's driving more bottom line profit. But unless you can really find a way to quantify it in the US, it's been my experience, you are not gonna get that, that buy-in. I was fascinated to see that for them, that foresight is agony. That was very interesting, Luke. Very interesting. I think you're right, Joyce. I, I really do. Um, it's such a great insight on your part. And that is focusing, um, and it's true here in Australia too, and, and I think throughout Asia Pacific. So it's my experience sort of agreeing with you. I think the benefits of foresight, such as risk reduction, um, innovation, um, anticipating multiple op uh, uh, right. possibilities, long longer term exploration, exploration of possibilities. Those are absolute benefits of doing foresight. I think we've just oversold ourselves in one area, and that is when it it that is when it trans or transitions into the actual strategic formula uh, strategy formulation process. Um, and that is, that is the area that I think we really didn't get right. Well, I, and I think that what you're highlighting is that most foresight consultants have not been trained in strategy. And that's, it's sad. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I had to osmose it. <laughs> But I, it was something that I learned or, or got the germ for in my MBA work. But nonetheless, thank you so much, Luke. This has been very interesting. And I'd love to see a copy of these slides. And perhaps I can write a Herman Trend Alert about it when I can stop writing about COVID. <laughs> Joyce, let me just say I've admired your work for years. Um, so it's so good to meet in person. It's lovely. Thank I you. will make those slides available to Tyler and he can distribute as he wishes. Thank you. That's very kind. And just quick follow up on that, Luke. Would you then, it's, it's basically you're saying um, one is, of course, don't try to sell foresight. Um, but two, is it, do you think that um, organizations, of course, they might not want to do this you know, this is extra work, but to quantify it, they could run outcome studies where teams that do foresight and then strategy versus teams that just do strategy um, and see what happens. I don't know how you would get them to do that, but. The, um, the appetite for organizations to do that kind of exercise is very low. Yeah, exactly. Um, they really want things to happen. Um, so to quantify the benefits, that's why we've seen a relatively good uptake in the public service because it's usually our work informing something like policy uh, and that's far more tangible than um, a strategic outcome due to the organizational strategy right so um 
you know, there are, and that's where Joyce is absolutely right. There are spaces in which foresight has enormous value and that is easier to convey than in the, um, in the, in the um, strategy value chain. Um, and, 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 and Joyce is right. There is this process of osmosis as a, as a practitioner, foresight practitioner, you know, I'll, I'll function as a foresight practitioner and then I'll, I'll sort of transition into a strategy practitioner and I'll leave that foresight mindset behind because now we're on to a linear uh, path to a preferred outcome and it's a completely different set of thinking. Um, and that's the, that's the part that we can, and I'm not saying don't sell foresight. In fact, I'm saying you have to sell foresight in order to achieve futures intelligence leadership of organizations in the strategy space. So it's just how do we articulate the benefits of that? Um, and, and my sense is that it's very intuitive to a leader that when they hear you have a narrow scope of possibility, would you prefer a broader scope of possibility, feasible possible futures that you haven't thought about in order to inform your strategy? They intuitively say, yes, of course, that's exactly what we should be doing. Mm. And, uh, Excuse me, Tyler, I just no, have a question for Luke, if I may. Please, please. Uh, obviously, I fully agree that uh, the MNCs in general have very short focus because of the quarterly review uh, reporting to Wall Street. And that's everywhere in the world, not only in the US. So that's a universal uh, problem that we need to deal with. But uh, look, I really see a window of opportunity now with the uncertainty and ambiguity that's around us for foresight because all the traditional strategy development, the formulation and execution uh, methods may not be relevant now like foresight and maybe uh, and that's actually a question for you. Maybe the focus of uh, foresight practitioners should uh, divert now towards developing the, the foresight competency in executives so they can see the need for it in, a in times of ambiguity and uncertainty like the ones we are in now. I would extend that in saying uh, it's actually the organizational system that we've got to try and educate and develop into an organizational culture that is anticipatory by nature. Uh, that's where the enormous value lies because unfortunately, those leaders still suffer from the syndrome that Michelle Godet um, suggested, which is when everything's going well, there's no need to look ahead. And when everything's going badly, there's still uh, no need to look ahead because they're reacting, right? So we see this in the pandemic 101. Um, prior to the pandemic, it was very much about making the buck in the next quarter. Uh, things are going well, let's just scale it up. Let's, let's adopt a growth mindset, et cetera. Abundance is the other buzzword. And those were all short-term orientations. Um, now that the pandemic has hit, they're all scurrying to fix it. And that's again, short-term. Um, so my, my response to you, Wade, is that nothing's really changed. Um, what might be a really fertile area for, for this kind of thinking right now is to actually socialize the idea that it's worthwhile or posing to them the hypothesis, if you had developed some form of foresight or um, anticipatory capacity in your organization would the effects of this uh, dramatic system shift or, or break, would, the, would your hazards and your costs and everything associated negatively with it, would that have changed? And a lot of them would have said yes. We should have had a far more anticipatory system so that people in our HR department would have anticipated the possibility of a, a dramatic shift in HR or our production and supply chains. Um, if those people had a, a foresight capability, they might have seen and therefore developed a memory of the future of what something like this might look like. Um, and that's the big sell right now, Wade. I think the big sell right now is 
not necessarily in this strategy value chain that I've proposed. I think the big sell now is to tap into their intuition, which says, if you as an organization were more anticipatory, would there have been benefits in your response to the pandemic? And they would say yes, of course. Um, so that's, I think, the big gap is, and Rene Rohrbeck, for those of you who are interested, he's been doing some great work in this space, is building the organizational capability of foresight, which would then naturally feed into whatever um, uh, decision-making process uh, that takes place in the organization, including then the strategy-making process, but not, not limited to it. Thank you. Uh, Zabrina, do you want to say something about your comment? I thought that was really interesting. Hi. Um, yeah. I, hi, Lou. Good to see you again. Yeah, um, good to see you too, Sabrina. And everybody on the chat. So I'm, you know, plugging away here in the United States, um, in the D.C. area, uh, working on my dissertation for Fielding Graduate University in the Human and Organizational Systems Program. And I'm focusing on getting um, the, the perceptions of uh, K-12 superintendents of themselves as um, agents for equity and social change with a lens on futures thinking. Um, and it's and so the protocol um, is 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 basically based in um, in futures thinking and in foresight and in the way that I've structured the interviews is we first talk about, you know, their leadership in terms of their, the, they talk about the strategies that they've employed to bring about more equity, but then we um, move into a visioning opportunity. And what's amazing to me is the um, visceral reactions that I see in their, you know, in, in physically, um, you know, many have been emotional um, when they have the opportunity to envision what the future would look like for their, um, you know, for their respective uh, school districts. And so, you know, I am very excited about um, analyzing that data once I've completed the interviewing process. Um, because there definitely is something there. And what's become very apparent, even just prior to my uh, analysis, is um, that education leaders are, are woefully constrained um, from that level of creativity, even as they oversee you know, the development of children you know, which, so, which as we know, you know, like you said earlier, Luke, um, oftentimes that's where, you know, children go to, for their creativity to die, right? Um, but the other thing is that when given the opportunity to start to envision preferred and, you know, possible and preferred futures and to do it in a way where they look at what would happen, you know, look at it strategically, um, what would happen if there was no change, if there was incremental change, or if there was radical change or some type of integration, and, um, and they just blossom. So it's a very exciting um, liminal space to be in. Um, and so I really appreciate this conversation. It's always good to connect and keep on walking to the light in your studies. <laughs> Thank you're, you. almost, you're almost there, Sabrina. Um, look, I've got two views on this. Um, the first view is that when people are given the opportunity to envision, uh, they're essentially being asked to create an image of the mind. And now we go right back to the Jovenel. We do this naturally. We create this image in our mind of what might happen. And certainly if we're contemplating action. Um, and that image of the mind is the source of all human agency. Um, so what is actually happening there, I think, is that when they're given the opportunity to envision, it's actually agency coming into into um, being, um, they're sensing, or um, I, I, I'm envisioning, therefore I am, that kind of logic. And that's intuitively very real um, uh, for them. So that's the first thing is, given the opportunity to envision, um, and when we envision, we actually 
are getting rubber on the road in terms of um, in terms of agency, and that's what that's what that that uh, in my opinion dynamic is all about. One of my real concerns, serious concerns in the futures foresight space, especially as it relates to leadership, is that we sort of default to strategy. And I've been working a lot with Richard Slaughter lately. Um, uh, in fact, he's working in our program, which I'm very excited about. And I went back to his 1996 paper around um, uh, foresight beyond strategy. Uh, now you'll note that he also was one of the early people that coined strategic foresight. The problem with this is we all automatically say if we're doing futures, we therefore are doing strategy. And it's not true. Um, in all cases, uh, foresight capabilities can lead into so many things. And can you now see that the concept on its own foresight capability can feed into other things such as uh, developing others around us to also see broader scopes of possibilities. Um, foresight could also inform operational decisions, not necessarily strategic decisions. So we almost default or we almost um, uh, use as one idea this idea of foresight and strategy are lumped together. It doesn't. Foresight stands on its own. It can feed into strategy and oh, why, why, why would that be? Well, it's very seductive. It's very seductive because it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, you know, oh, where can I monetize my foresight? Oh, there's this big industry, let me make it strategic. And it's not always about strategy. Um, so that's what I'll leave you with, Sabrina, is that that group are actually developing in their districts and potentially broader, they're developing an anticipatory system, which might very well feed in to how they uh, strategize about the future. Thank you. Anyone else have a question for Luke? Anyone else? Last call. Um, <laughs> Luke, anything think, else you want to add? No, I'm not going to add anything. I'm, I think <laughs> in the, the spirit of being around the fire, I'm interested in uh, Matea's, um, yeah, he's at, he's studying. Okay. Uh, Matea, what's your topic? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I want it, yeah, I'm to discuss now or later, but you know, that, that it's good. It's good. Thank, thank you for, for bringing me in, in, in the conversation. Um, yeah, the topic is um, strategic decision making. So using, um, sorry, sorry, let, let me rephrase, sorry. Um, using uh, future literacy or, or future thinking in uh, strategic decision making regarding new product development. So the, it's, um, I, I think that is gonna talk to the strategy or, or vice versa, right? It's more, um, developing, making decision on, on ideas, on innovative ideas, um, and using uh, futures, being future literacy and using future thinking to, to analyze them and not just having analytical metrics, as you said before, that many use. Uh, um, let me, let me, sorry, I, I don't, I don't like to talk without a camera, but I have a lot of stuff. Behind here, so apologize to not having that on before. Um, I actually don't look good now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. So it's um, it is about that, and um, and there are so many um, people that use just like solid metrics, uh, and no, um, and not even uncertainty. I mean, uncertainty could be a quite um, quite a metrics. And ambiguity could be quite a metric as well. I actually like the comment that Wei made about, uh, you know, the um, seeing uncertainties and ambiguity at this point in time as opportunities, uh, and that's basically 
basically what 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 my research is about yeah oh excellent yes and Josh just said that you gave a really uh, terrific <laughs> presentation at the collaborate uh, get together last week congratulations thank you Joy. see uh, <laughs> thank you no no but that you that is your it's your your um speech today i'm not i i, I will discuss that later I'm happy to share the slide with you and uh, you as well, uh, because I'm touching a little bit about anticipatory organization and uh, and the actuary organizations, and um, and I, I mean it's it, it's it's a conversation, it's a broad conversation for everyone, but having such capabilities, then it becomes quite natural to be anticipatory in practice across the entire organization. So it's not that the leaders must be anticipatory; is that if you have the mindset of thinking, um, you are more anticipatory in the web. And it's not being afraid of, of you know, or stress about what's you know, in the future. It's actually, okay, those are the things that could happen. I, I do this, this and that, and I move here or move there. I mean, it's very interesting that that's two different way of thinking. Yeah, it's interesting because we've got evidence that the organizational structures and hierarchies actually suppress that. So we may have individuals that have high levels of foresight, um, but unless the system accommodates that and enables that, you'll find that those individuals are suppressed. They're unable to express the full potential of, of that anticipation. And that's why the focus on leaders is critical because leaders enable those systems. Why? Because purely through their decision making, they design and, and create those systems, right? So I've seen people with very high levels, groups of people. I'll give you an example, and I don't think I'm under any obligation not to share this example. Um, large, uh, uh, big four organization, very, very large, um, had a team of very, very sharp um, uh, a partner and consultants. Um, and they had very high levels of um, foresight uh, spread across them all. So they're all speaking the same language. The partner had developed this, this um, small system uh, entity within the larger system to do this and it didn't take long it took about two years to close it down and they didn't close it down through a lack of performance they closed it down because those individuals left the system they left the organization so the system was suppressing them they became frustrated their value was seen elsewhere and possibly in another system that allowed them to um, action their capabilities. Um, so the system needs to be enabled and the people that enable that system are the leaders. And that's where the focus on leadership comes. I like that example a lot. It just reminds me of the, what I'm looking at is the brain and how it's anticipating the future. And one of the big things I look at is the context. And so the, whatever the context is, of the brain is going to influence what kind of content is available. And it reminds like, as you're saying, that's like, if you put the brain in certain context, it suppresses certain content. Um, and if you keep doing that over time, then that content will just stop showing up right in the brain. And those things that can be content like values. It can be content like um, past uh, information or strategies, or it can be sensations in the moment or intuition. Um, so I think it's kind of that interesting correlation there between the leader, and that context that he's setting, how that influences the team, but also the brain. And to, and to that, Tyler, um, I would add that foresight requires a bit of system thinking. Uh, is you need to, to see the cause effect of some things, and, and then you need to maintain the, the leadership in the, the, the the department of foresight that has been dismantled, but not because there were no uh, result of that, but there was no someone that was maintaining uh, the. Fair enough. Anyone else want to add any insights or input here? Or? 
we could start to wrap up. I, I just want to yeah. ask a question. Luke, uh, for the, that department that sort of evaporated, was it, did the champion leave or what happened exactly? The, the champ, well, as you know, systems or certainly entities within systems can, can degrade or degenerate uh, through entropy, systemic entropy. And so what was happening was not the partner with the good results, by the way, they showed the best results out of that whole, um, that whole division of, of the big four. Um, the partner was maintaining the results because he had a vested interest in it. However, some of the um, members of the team became incredibly frustrated and started looking outside the organization. Um, they were enabled by their partner, but everywhere else in the organization they went, they were getting kickback, right? And so they looked outside the organization and found other opportunities uh, where their aspirations would be met. And so gradually, over a period of two years, he lost three of his directors, okay? And they all now are fully blown CEOs in different industries. So he was left with a team that had lost its, its best um, capabilities. And so he was left on his own and he's also just left now. It's, so a, great, over, it's yeah. a great example of how you have to, to prepare the culture because mm. it, it's like when you look at why all of the, or, 80% of the quality initiatives failed. It was because the culture was not prepared for it. So I've long said that if you're going to actually be able to implement a program of strategic foresight within an organization, you must prepare the culture first. And, and that's a tough gig because especially for a short term, zero based organization, uh, they might listen to you, but uh, the, the, the culture is the short-term gains. Let's get those incentives, you know. Mm. Um. <laughs> well, it was a, a pleasure to see you again and to, uh, to chat with you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Tyler, very yeah. much for this. Welcome. Yeah, let's wrap up here. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you again. Uh, we'll be doing another fireside chat in a couple weeks. We have um, Loretta Bruning is going to be talking about pathways to resilience. She's an author of uh, books on uh, brain chemistry um, and stress as well. So I hope to see you all then. Until then, uh, have a great rest of your day or evening wherever you're at and hope to see you in the future.